Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Jos Visser. I am from Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the, uh, the USENIC speaker guidelines um, contains an instruction to the speakers to give trigger warnings. So I would like to give you a trigger warning. Um, I am originally from the Netherlands, where we are likely to say anything that comes up in our head because our sense of humor is we say terrible things that upset people and that makes us laugh. So if you can't deal with that, now is a great time to leave. And as an indication of how times have changed, as we had a gentleman from Microsoft up here in a polo and a gentleman from Google is wearing a button-down shirt. It is, that's not because I've elated to the to levels of management, but my fiance kindly asked me, maybe not a t-shirt every day. So, and as we say in America, happy wife, happy life. So, so that the married people feel sympathy for this. So here's a problem. So I used to be in uh, YouTube as a re, um, and at YouTube we do lots of video uploads, and we also have lots of people watching videos. And so the problem that we had was, uh, so people watch videos and then the view count goes up. And you might know the view count, it's this number at the bottom right of the watch page, no one really knows what that number represents, but it's a number and it goes up pretty much a as people watch videos. It doesn't go up every time you watch a video for reasons of spamming. So we get some signals from our caching nodes and from like whatever, and then we de-spam them and then we upload the, uh, the number into the database. Uh, and that database is MySQL because we acquired uh, YouTube and they loved MySQL and so we still run a fair amount of YouTube infrastructure on MySQL. But one of the problems with MySQL is that it doesn't rate limit very well. I mean, it, MySQL is awesome, but it's not always as awesome as we need it to be. So every so many minutes we launch this batch process which gets all these numbers, despams it, calculates a new view count, and then uh, executes a bunch of insert statements. And regularly, even though we shard and we replicate and do this, that, and the other thing, that process would regularly send more insert statements to MySQL than we could deal with. And then I get paged, which makes me unhappy. Um, so we, we thought a bit on how to deal with this problem, and then, like most of you, I get my best ideas in the shower and while holid on holiday and, and on the bicycle. And I thought, like, well, what we maybe should do is figure out a way for these tasks that do these insert statements to rate limit themselves. Now, rate limiting is in itself a simple problem. Like, pretty much during our interviews, if you can't write a local rate limiter, you're not going to get hired. But rate limiting gets harder if you have a number of clients that run in a number of data centers here, there, and everywhere, and that try to talk to a shared resource, such as a MySQL server, that is not able to deal with all that traffic, uh, then rate limiting is not a very obvious problem because at the, you want to make sure that together these guys don't send more than n QPS of traffic, uh, but if one of them doesn't have a lot to do, you would like other tasks to pick up that slack. So what we wanted is a solution that um, allowed a number of client tasks, be it batch jobs or daemons uh, on Unix machines, web servers or command line tools, to coordinate among themselves so that together they would not send more than a maximum amount of traffic to a shared service, in this case MySQL, but we have other problems. Uh, sorry, we have other uh, servers that, that have similar problems. Um, but also in a way that if the, the, the combination of all these tasks would want to send a lot of traffic, we max out the available capacity. So if some of them slacks or goes away, we want that capacity seamlessly distributed um, among um, uh, the, the other tasks. So uh, from that came Dorman, uh, a system for doing globally uh, distributed uh, client-side rate limiting. The um, the way we designed this, or this it's really, I think it's really important to understand like, where these systems are coming from, because usually when you send trying to design document, you get like tons of comments that say like, oh, it doesn't do this, that, and the other thing, and that's usually correct because we didn't design it for that. We designed this for clients to prevent themselves getting throttled by the server, because we do have throttling technology, but there's some cost involved in failure, 
and then clients get an error back from the server and typically uh, exponential back off is beyond most software developers we find. Um, so we didn't want to get throttled. It is cooperative, right, because it's all happening in the Google Cloud, so we, we, we basically, if someone wants to screw us, we'll give them a call. Um, and we want to uh, yeah, have this as a globally distributed solution. So we went out um, and created Doorman. And with Doorman, we can take a resource, be it a MySQL server shard or like an RPC server, a big table tablet server, or like anything that has a limited capacity but which is a single source of truth or maybe like a source of truth with a small number of instances. Uh, and we, uh, we want to apportion the available capacity and lease it to the clients globally. We want each client to get their fair share for some pluggable definition of fair. Uh, kind of hard to solve that problem, so as every good computer science uh, uh, engineer, we hit this behind an interface and you can plug definitions of fairness in there. We got a couple that come with, uh, that come with the frame, um, and we call them proportional share and fair share, uh, and they do a, a fairly decent job of handing out capacity based on what clients want. So clients that want to send a bunch of traffic to uh, one of these services that is protected by Dorman give out uh, capacity. Um, and the way that basically works is the client says, like, hey, I want to send this amount of QPS. And then the service says, like, oh, okay, you'll get this. Or the Dorman service says, well, you get this. And then we expect the client to uphold that. And then we have some nice libraries that make it easy for the clients to actually do that, where the communication with the Dorman server is, uh, is hidden. So this is what that then looks like. Um, we have client tasks in a variety of languages that want to talk to that shared resource. We have a dormant server written in Go on the lower left because that's the new hotness. And the, uh, it was not my choice. I wanted to do C++, but like we had a volunteer that wanted to work on it in Go, and then we had an intern. So that, <laughs> that's, that's how these things go. Right? Like, um, and then once I'm really happy with it, I'll rewrite it in C++ because. <laughs> A little bit of a sidestep. I have found that people who hate C++ hate computers. Like, <laughs> they want computers to be so softer and rounder and just more elegant and forgiving than they actually are. Right? <laughs> if you want to know more about this philosophy, please talk to me during one of the coffee breaks. Um, the client tasks can be written in whatever. We've got libraries for uh, Python, C++, and Go. Um, and I'm currently working on Google Flights, which is written in Lisp. So I'm working on a Lisp client just because it's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so the, we, we, we publish the protocol so the client can talk to protocol, but it's actually much easier if the client just uses one of our libraries. Because if you use the library in Python, we have a decorator, and in C++, we have some sort of class, which makes it really easy to sort of pass a barrier. And when you pass that barrier, you know you're good to go for that request and all the magic of like, making sure that you don't overshoot your assigned capacity and um, talking to the dormant server, et cetera, is all handled in that library. We, um, we use gRPC uh, for the communication between the client tasks and the dormant server, and that's because the internal version uses our internal version of gRPC. I'm not entirely happy with that, and I'm thinking I'm going to rewrite that bit to JSON RPC because it's just way easier to use and we don't need many of the super advanced features um, of gRPC. All right, so this is the, 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 the story that we ended up with. So the, uh, the Dorman protocol, it's, re it's really simple. There, there's, not, there's not a lot of magic going on there at this level. Um, a client that wants to participate in Dorman, and it is voluntarily, right? So we, we ask software developers, like, you know, you're talking to this thing here, please use Dorman, here's the library, and then we'll make sure that you don't overshoot your, uh, your, your rate limit. And they typically want to do that, because if they don't, then they page us, and they will get unhappy. Um, discover the master, we have a request, which basically says, like, hey, Dorman server, I am task blah, um, and I want to access resource foo, and I want to. I currently have like 100 QPS, and I would love to have 200. 
And then the dormant server goes back, uh, goes off and does something and gets back like, well, you know, you get this many QPSs, uh, this lease is valid for so many minutes, and please come back to me every so many seconds. And that refresh interval is actually an important part of the dormant system, so I'll get back there. The, the obvious problem with this system, of course, is figuring out the wanted capacity, right? Because what, what system knows how fast they want to go? Like, typically they don't. They just get some data, do something, send out an RPC, get some more data, does something, and gets another, wants to do another RPC. And that's where the client library comes in. Because if you use our client libraries, they contain some magic that will figure out how fast you want to go by observing the, the, the behavior of the, the client binary. Right? So if the client binary calls our wait operation to jump over the barrier in order to issue an RPC or a request, by the pattern of waits and by timing how long it takes between when they leave us and when they come back, we can do some math and figure out how fast they want to go. Uh, so it's extremely helpful for Dorman to know this. Um, and that algorithm we have does like a fairly decent job of actually figuring out how fast the client wanted to go. All right, so the, um, that's another advantage of using that, that library. The, all the magic um, happens uh, in, in the server in this sense, and, and some of it on the client. So in Dorman, we talk about capacity. Um, this is a floating point number. The Dorman server doesn't particularly care what that capacity represents. Uh, in most of our examples, we assume this capacity to be a rate. All right, so that means like it's like a QPS or a QPM or like whatever, some sort of rate of requests per time unit. But there's nothing actually in Dorman that makes this uh, the only kind of capacity you can manage. So you can also do uh, query cost per second or max in-flight transactions if you have a gauge style metric. The current client library is very rate centric uh, because I still haven't figured out the API for doing gauge style uh, capacities where you say like, oh, I, I want a maximum of like 20 in-flight transactions or 50 in-flight transactions. I haven't quite figured out yet how to make the client library work efficiently and, and, and elegantly for that. Uh, as soon as I'm on that, and maybe there's another intern, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get right on that. Like I said, the, uh, the client library is support currently Go, uh, Python, and C++. Uh, Java is obviously planned and Lisp, because I said that, just because it's cool. Um, fourth, if you want, like I just unearthed my first Lisp book from 1983. Actually, that's what you get if you're level 50. There you can. Um, it contains some interfaces for uh, registering new resources, declaring the wanted capacity, or having the library figure it out, uh, registering a callback uh, for when a new capacity lease comes in and stuff like that. There's, it's fairly obvious and, and simple to use in that sense. It does multi-thread, which not all the client systems find easy to deal with. The Python client is multi-threaded, and as we all know, uh, Python has quite some problems with heavily multi-threaded code, and if you don't know, you should maybe not be writing multi-threaded Python. Um, it, it was important to us because the YouTube uh, interface, YouTube is mostly written in Python. Right? It's, the, it's the greatest, it's the biggest, maybe, maybe even the greatest uh, Python app um, on the planet, so that was kind of important for us. Um, what is uh, specifically interesting about Doorman, because it uses globally um, distributed, or it, it's, it implements globally distributed client-side rate limiting, is that you need to be able to have clients um, like everywhere on the planet. And because of that, um, and we implemented something called the Doorman server tree. And the Doorman server tree allows you to create a tree of Doorman servers, a bit like uh, one global root, then depending on how you want to lay out your network. You can have dormant servers per continent and then dormant servers per cluster or per data centers. And then what happens is your clients talk to the highest level or lowest level, depending on how you like to 
paint your trees, but I think trees have their roots usually at the bottom. Um, so to the highest level dormant servers, ask and register their capacity there, get leases from there, and then these dormant servers talk to each other to distribute capacity globally. So you can, you can lay out this tree in whichever way you want. If you have a small setup, you can just have one node, one, one, only the root node. Um, or you can have like one level or two or four or like how many, however many layers of, uh, of dormant servers you want in that tree. An aspect in this, uh, in this topology is what we call convergence. Right? So if a, if a new client starts up on the far right in this graph and it starts asking for a lot of capacity, then the, the, the dormant tree needs to balance the tree globally. So what happens then is capacity, if there's slack capacity, then it can make that available. If there is no slack capacity, it uh, needs to sort of steal capacity from clients on the other side of the planet and converge that to the tree all the way to the left or right, depending on where you are. The, um, the speed of that, the larger the tree, obviously, the slower that convergence is. Uh, but with a th in a three node tree, typically after 30 seconds, the tree has rebalanced itself uh, and capacity is where, we're, where we think um, it needs to be. Right? Um, so this, this feature makes it possible to run Dorman uh, as a globally distributed um, system. Now the, um, the Dorman server is the guy who keeps all that uh, state about which clients exist and which clients um, sort of have what amount of capacity. So every node in this tree is like one or more dormant servers, like we're in SRE, so we don't write systems that have single points of failure. And I'll explain how that, uh, how that works in a moment. But each of these things here that says node, cluster node, continental node, root node, is three or more dormant servers. Each of these can be in a, uh, in a single uh, data center, except for the root node, which for ma reasons of maintenance and availability needs to be split out across three different data centers. Now, if you have a tree like this, if you remember the slide on the dormant protocol, the first thing that happens is that the dormant client needs to find its master. Um, and it doesn't really matter which of these dormant servers it talks to. Right? So you can set it up uh, in any way you want. In the version we have inside Google, we use some magic to find the closest dormant server with available capacity. Uh, but in the open source version, we specify a list of, of dormant servers and dormant just tries to talk to any of them. Uh, and the moment it finds the first one, it's good to go. Right? So it would not be a problem if a client on the top left would talk to the dormant server on the lower right. Uh, that would still achieve the aim of a globally distributed, sort of more, more or less fairly distributed um, capacity. Now, the, the, the highest level dormant servers here know all their own clients and how much capacity they want and how much capacity they have. And it gets that capacity from the dormant server below that all the way down to the root. However, uh, when designing this, we decided, if you look, if you sort of take one of these nodes and you look at the three dormant servers in there, to not implement any sort of sophisticated state replication between the dormant servers inside the node. Right, so if you check any of these dormant servers in a cluster or in a, in a continent or in a, the three in a root node, one of these is the master for that node. So, so dormant uses a single master for each node in the server tree and it uses etc. D master election to appoint a master from the number of candidates. So in each of these uh, nodes, you have like say three or five or whatever uh, amount of dormant servers, one of them Ha is the master for that node, and it has all the state of all the clients, and all the clients talk to that node. By virtue of etc. D master election, if a dormant client talks to any of the dormant servers in that node, it gets back the address of the actual master. 
maybe because they use etc. D to indicate who the master is in that node, and then the client talks to that dormant server. So discovering the master is typically a, a two round trip thing. Like you talk to a random dormant server, if it's not the master, it will tell you like, hey, I'm not the master, this dude over there is the master, and then you talk to them uh, for your request. Same, if one of them dies and comes back, it loses the master election, you talk to it again, you're like, oh, no, I'm not the master, the guy over there is the master. Um, and that then is one of the reasons to build a dormant server tree, because all of the clients that talk to a node talk to a single master in that node. So depending on how many clients you have and on what sort of hardware you run, your dormant server can sustain a couple of thousand clients at the same time from like a network connection point of view. Um, and if you have more than that, you will need to split up that tree so as to distribute the amount of client connections over a larger number of dormant servers. So dormant doesn't do um, state replication with the slaves. It also does not write out its state to durable storage. So everything that Dorman knows about its clients is stored in RAM. No syncing with replicas, no background storage. So that means that if it goes away and it comes back, or it goes away and another guy wins the master election, that server is like completely empty, has like no state whatsoever. So that means from that point on, if it starts getting requests, it has no idea what to answer. Um, the way we solve that is by something called learning mode. Oh. And learning mode is the facility where if a dormant server starts up and it becomes the master and it knows nothing of the world, it knows that it knows nothing about the world. Also, what then happens is that clients start talking to it. So with each client request, the clients tell the dormant server, this is what I want and this is what I have. And we know that the previous allocation of capacity among the clients represented a stable state in the system. So what the dormant server can do is then just return whatever the client already had, right, because that represents a stable state. But in the meantime, it builds up its, uh, internal, uh, its, its internal state about all the clients. Now, because each client gets capacity for a lease period, after the lease period expired, the dormant server knows that either every client that exists has talked to it again, or that client has lost its lease. And from that moment on, the dormant server knows that its internal uh, state is completely good. And then it can start doing the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So when dormant starts up, for the first five minutes, it will just, if that's your lease period, it will just hand out whatever capacity it has, or, no, sorry, it will hand out whatever capacity you say you have until the lease period expires and then it starts running the algorithm. We have some flags where you can shorten that period, right, because apart from a lease uh, period, we also have a refresh interval. Typically, leases are about like th five minutes. Refresh intervals are like five seconds. And the refresh interval is a request to the client to report back in this many seconds. So typically speaking, after five seconds, you've heard from all your clients. Right? So after five seconds, you could consider the state valid, but clients could have dropped packets, clients could be frozen for a while, clients do whatever. So it depends on how much risk um, you want to take. So that's a bit of a drawback, is maybe a strong word, but it's a, it's a behavior of the dormant server that you want to be aware of. Uh, but the upside of that is there's no state replication necessary and no durable storage, which makes the dormant server like incredibly more uh, simple to write um, and to run. So dormant works on a, um, on a server configuration, uh, which internally in the Google it's in protocol buffers, but in the open source version it's in YAML. And that server uh, configuration tells dormant which resources exist, um, and a resource could be a server, a MySQL server, an RPC server, like something else, like whatever, Dorman doesn't really care, but it has a name. Um, how much capacity is available, um, and what algorithm needs to be used to hand out capacity for this particular uh, resource. So this configuration, has two uh, resources. One is called, uh, let me see, uh, uh, FAIR, uh, and the other one is called STAR. 
uh, and we, we use some sort of globbing to make sure that you can templatize a whole bunch of resources that have more or less the same name or that use the same name structure with one entry in this uh, configuration. Um, this, uh, this, the, fair, the resource called FAIR is uh, managed by an algorithm called FAIRSHARE, which is an awesome algorithm, uh, but it's n squared in the number of clients. Um, we have an algorithm that is slightly simpler, it's called proportional, which is uh, order n in the number of clients, but in some edge cases it doesn't really do a really good job of distributing the capacity fairly. So again, uh, something for you to choose, and if you can code Go, you can add algorithms to this uh, system. The, the Dorman protocol supports priorities of clients, but none of the algorithms that we have today use that in any meaningful way. All right, so the, um, there's, you see a, a, a mention there of a field called safe capacity. Uh, the safe capacity feature plays a role when the lease runs out because there's, if there's some sort of situation where all the dormant servers in the world go down, um, then all your clients might suddenly lose all their leases and all traffic would stop and we have a safety feature for that, it's called safe capacity. It's a bit too intricate to explain now in great detail, but there's a couple of ways in which you configure that, and one of the ways in which you can configure it is for the dormant server to recalculate the safe capacity at every client request, and then when the dormant server goes down, clients stay stuck at that safe capacity. Like, and then at least you, shit is happening, well, you have to sort of like get up, wake up, make coffee, connect to the VPN, you know, find your security key, um, log on, forget your password, etc. I got some some graphs of Dorman in action. Um, these graphs are a bit uh, a bit intricate, so I'll I'll take a couple of minutes to explain them. Um, this graph shows one well-behaved client's wanted capacity and the capacity it got in Dorman, from Dorman. So the blue line is the wanted capacity and the red line is the capacity it got from Dorman. And you see that these lines are basically overlapping, which means that he got exactly what he wanted. So this client asked for 180, 200, 120 QPS, and that's exactly what he got. So that means there were no and there was no capacity shortfall, there was enough capacity to go around um, for everyone. This is the same sort of graph, but with a slightly different client. Again, the blue line is what this client wanted, and the red line is what he got. And what you can see up till T is, uh, let's say, 600, these lines overlap, and then the client spikes, which means that suddenly the blue line shoots up, client wants more capacity. What you see is he gets less capacity, so he's stuck at that lower capacity level, but then what happens is that as the system iterates, Dorman is stealing away capacity from other clients and giving it to this client. So the, the red line trends up because Dorman tries to fulfill this client's uh, capacity within the constraint um, of all the other things that are happening on the planet and then the client spikes down again and Dorman follows it and there's another little spike uh, and then this run was over. Um, this is a global view, so the previous picture was one um, uh, from one particular client. This is a global view where the, the yellow line is the maximum capacity we have for this resource, which is 1,000 QPS. The red line is the sum of all the capacity that Dorman handed out and the blue line is the sum of all the capacity that the clients wanted. So you see that these sums match, and Dorman does a great job of sort of keeping uh, the sum at that, uh, at that max. And then at T, again, about 600, this is actually from the same run, but a global view, uh, the sum of the requested capacity goes over the maximum, so all clients together want more than 1,000 QPS, and from that point on, Dorman caps all these clients exactly at that line of 1,000 QPS. It, sees, it, it might seem if it overshoots it a little, but that's a, it's a graphing error. If you look at the spreadsheet, it all works out wonderfully. And then this last graph is the, uh, indicates the accuracy of the determination of the wanted capacity, 
Like I told you that the client library has a feature where it observes the calling behavior of its binary and then figures out uh, what, how many QPS this client wants. And we run some experiments with that. And here, the, the blue line is what the client actually wanted, and the red line is the dormant client library's estimation of what it wanted. So you see there's about a 5% difference at times between that estimation uh, and the actual ones. So this is sort of to verify um, that algorithm that we have. So it's, it's safe to use that, that feature. That is basically what we want to show here. And this graph, by the way, comes from the Python client. So if you go to GitHub and you use all your Google skills, then you, or, or, sorry, let's say another. If you go to GitHub or you use all your Google skills, then you can find the dormant source code because we, we decided to open, open source it. Um, if you execute these commands in order, you have a running Dorman on your Linux system uh, with something called the Dorman shell, which is a, a tool that you can use to experiment a bit with what happens if I ask for, for this much by this client and this much by that client, and then Dorman will show you, the shell will show you what it, uh, what it did. All right, so it's a couple of compilations, and then you start this, uh, this thing up. Uh, currently developed by three people. Uh, Roshanya is with Google in Sydney. Uh, Rick unfortunately left us and he's now a free man in Poland, free man of the land, uh, and I'm in, uh, in Cambridge, Mass. Um, two minutes at a time, so I would like to uh, not stress you even more by impeding your run to the coffee corner, but I'll be here for the next two and a half days and I would love the opportunity to talk about Dormon because I think it's awesome. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>